Thanks for coming out to be with us on a rainy Sunday morning. I am really proud of you guys for being here. And all you people watching online, you get maybe a B for the day. These folks get A pluses all the way around for the bad weather. Hey, if you're a guest, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. I've met a couple of folks from out of town, a couple of folks from in town, and we're just happy that you're here. If you're traveling, we wish and pray traveling mercies for you. If you're from in town, Glad, glad you stopped by, and we're honored by that, because you could be anywhere you wanted to be this morning, but you're here, and we, we appreciate that. There is a card on the seat in front of you. You can uh, fill one of those out uh, and uh, indicate any uh, needs that you may have, and we'd be happy to try and meet those. I can't guarantee you that we can meet every need, but we will try. And if you have a prayer request, please indicate that on that card, and we'll be praying about those things first thing tomorrow morning. Just uh, put those in the collection plate when they pass a little bit later in the service. Hey, can I get you to stand? Uh, we're going to continue our time of praise, focusing on the awesomeness of our God, our Creator, our Maker. And I want to uh, set us up with this from Psalm 95. We're about to sing a song from Psalm 148, but uh, this, is a, this psalm just fits right in with that. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. 
Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song because the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. And that's who we're here to worship today. Let's praise him together. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the high. Son and the angels before him. Before him. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They have no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Holy, holy are you, Lord. The whole earth is filled with your glory. Let the nations rise to
refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's be seated as we take our offering. Rock of ages, clap for me, clap me Let's all pray together for communion. Lord, because of the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory to the face of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God, thank you so, so very much for the mercy of Jesus Christ and for the wonder that he has created within us your people. Give us the, the, uh, the courage 
the passion, um, the wisdom to be as he was in flesh here on earth. May we make you proud, O Lord, by being your church, the way you have designed us to be. Help us to be more and more aware of how you have created us in your image with this bread. Amen. Let's pray again for the, uh, the cup. Uh, God, through your son, although he was tempted in every way, he did not sin. And by his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil. And to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Your mercy is too great for us, God. We are too grateful for it, but please, by your goodness, help us be more self-aware of the world you are offering to us. We take this cup, God, and we are very thankful as we drink. Um, Lord, your mercy is too good. We give you all thanks. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
February 23rd, there's a note about this in your bulletin, uh, we are going to be a host congregation for um, a program called Right Now Work as Worship Conference. And we've got a video that uh, explains what that is, so give that a listen here for just a second. Work. Most of us spend over half our lives at work. Whatever it is you fill the nine to five with, planting crops, building cars, taking care of patients, teaching students, or running a business. Work is where most of life happens. For some, work is a drain. They dread Monday mornings, forcing themselves to struggle through because they need the paycheck, while many times feeling trapped and beaten down by their job. Some people love their work. They're good at what they do. It energizes them. It's a place of security, a place to chase dreams, desires, and success. At work, they find fulfillment. We often forget to connect our faith to our work. We don't consider the reasons God may have us at our job. We don't think about the purpose and meaning we could bring to our work. We simply focus on how it makes us feel. But what if we saw our work as an opportunity to worship? As Christians, we are called to serve Christ with our lives. For a few, that means working as a pastor, a youth minister, or a missionary. Others serve the church by teaching children or singing in the choir. But when Sunday is over, most of us return to our jobs outside the church. For us, our mission is in the marketplace. We may not be the kind of missionary who moves to the far regions of Africa, but around the conference table, around the water cooler, or around the cubicle, we have an opportunity to worship the God who created us. He gave us skill. He gave us passion. He gave us work. When we do our jobs with excellence and integrity and diligence, it's an act of worship. We are displaying God's craftsmanship to the non-believing world around us. We are earning the right to be heard. We don't see a divide between Sunday and Monday, between the sacred and the secular, We've been invited into parts of the world that a pastor or traditional missionary will never see. We have conversations with people who would never set foot in a church. Whether we love or dread our work, we choose to turn the focus away from ourselves and towards the mission God has for us. Church is not the only place we worship, and Sundays are not the only days on our calendars that have meaning. Every day on mission for God brings us great joy. Like the heroes before us, 
we can be modern day Noah's and Joseph's and Peter's who are called with a purpose. God has designed us. He created us to work and to worship. For us, work is worship. On February 23rd, 2018, over 2,000 churches across the country are hosting the first ever Work as Worship retreat. Please join us and other business leaders from your church and community. Speakers will include Patrick Lencioni, Matt Chandler, Joel Manby, Phil Fisher, and many more. Tickets are only $25 at www.workasworshipretreat.org. We'll see you there. And the cool thing, when we do the conference here, it'll all be on one screen. That'll be... <laughs> February 23rd. That really would be a good event. So well, there's more in the bulletin about it. You can go online and take a look at it as well. So our leadership here at Twickenham has challenged us to read through the Bible together this year, to be in the Word in 2018. And it's about to get tough because we're getting into Leviticus now. Okay? This is where Christian Marines come out, all right? We're about to land on the beach and assault the book of Leviticus. So I'm a little bit behind in mine, actually. So, But it's a good thing. You can go to our website and find uh, some great resources to help you with that challenge. There is a card in your bulletin this morning that gives you uh, some uh, web addresses to go to, so our, our uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, or, uh, Twitter, and um, Instagram uh, accounts. You can go to and take a look at those. Um, we're meeting each Wednesday night at 6.30 to talk about what we've been reading together and to kind of help challenge each other to stay in the Word and, and keep going. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been in this series, Text Message. It is written, but is it true? Because if we're going to be spending all this time in the Bible, it's worth asking if what we are reading is reliable and relevant and true. And so w- what I'd like to do is kind of catch you up on what we talked about so far. A couple of weeks ago, we, we looked at how the earliest Christians viewed the scriptures. And what we found is that whenever they faced a crisis or a problem or an opportunity, they looked to the scriptures to formulate a response. They grounded everything they did in the scriptures. And they learned that from Jesus himself. Um, he, he grounded his very ministry when he launched his ministry in Luke chapter 4. He started by reading the book of Isaiah, and he said, this is, this is my agenda. This is what I'm going to be doing. When he encountered temptation from Satan, he responded to Satan with, it is written, referring to the scriptures. And even when he was dying on the cross, he, he articulated his anguish by quoting Psalm 22, quoting the words of David. And so to Jesus, and this is a huge statement, To Jesus, the words written by human beings in the scriptures were nothing less than the very words of God. So then last week we talked about why they had such confidence in the scriptures and why we can have that same kind of confidence. And we looked in a a passage toward the end of the Bible in in, in a book of the book called 2 Peter chapter 1, where Peter gives us three reasons to trust what we read. The first one was that that the events described in the Bible, people were willing to die for those. People who lived very close to those events, they were willing to die for the truth of that event. Now that alone doesn't make it true, and we talked about this last week, that that there are people who will die for a lie. We talked about the 9-11 terrorists. They died for what is a lie. But people will not die for what they know is a lie. And so you have these people that were eyewitnesses or, had heard, or that, that, that had, had, uh, had witnessed this stuff, and so they, they believed it. And then that's the second one, the testimony of eyewitnesses. People were willing to die for what they believed to be the truth, and then second, you had these eyewitnesses. We can trust it, because the people reporting this news saw it with their own eyes, they heard it with their own ears, they touched Jesus with their own hands, or they, they talked to people who had seen him, heard him, and touched him. And then finally, Peter tells us that what we read in the Bible is not just a bunch of stuff that that imaginative writers made up. He says that they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, or as Paul puts it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, they were inspired. And when we say that the Scriptures were inspired, we're not talking about the effect the Scriptures have. We're not saying, oh, that's inspiring, that that passage is inspiring, the way a symphony or a, a musical score or a painting might be inspiring. 
What we're talking about is the origin. The word inspired means God breathed. And so what Peter and what Paul were saying is that what we read in the scriptures came from the very mouth of God. So this morning, we're going to bring this series to a close. And uh, we're, going to, our, we're going to continue getting into the Word all through the year, uh, reading Scripture together. If you haven't started it or if you're already behind, just pick up where we are, okay? Don't let that stop you from doing this. This would be a great benefit for you. But what I, what I wanted to do was take one more opportunity to talk to you about the nature of the Bible and why it's worth reading, reflecting, living. So we talked about eyewitness testimony. We, we talked about inspiration I want to give you another I word, okay, the, uh, that sets the Bible apart as the true and reliable word of God, and that is the word inerrant, inerrant. To say that the Bible is inerrant is to say that everything the Bible affirms is true. It's free from falsehood, fraud, or deceit, which is a really huge claim. Inerrancy means that the Bible Never gets anything wrong. Think about it this way. If you, if you watch a lot of baseball, I know there's a bunch of baseball fans out here. You know that, that most batters bat right-handed. And so most ground balls are going to go up the middle and to the left of second base, which is where the shortstop plays. Other than the pitcher and the catcher, the shortstop is the most critical defensive position on the field. Cal Ripken Jr. of the Baltimore Orioles holds the single-season record for the fewest errors by a shortstop. In 1990, he had, anybody know? Three. Three errors at shortstop. That is a phenomenal accomplishment. Inerrancy means that the Bible is better than Cal Ripken Jr. He also holds the record for the most consecutive games with 2,632. They call him the Iron Man of Baseball. The Bible beats that record, too. Now, here's what I'm guessing. You would not be surprised, I bet, to find that there are folks that find that hard to believe. The truth is, some of us may find that kind of hard to believe. We're not afraid to talk about hard things here, so let's talk about this. A good way to do that is to make sure we understand what we are not saying when we say that the Bible is inerrant. And here's maybe the most important thing you'll hear me say today. To say that the Bible is inerrant is not to say that our interpretations or claims for the Bible are inerrant or without error. Look, I know, I know for a fact that some of my past interpretations of the Bible and some of the claims I have made for the Bible were flat wrong. I know that. I suspect that some of my interpretations are wrong right now. Now, if I'm, when I become totally convinced of that, I will abandon those, but I'll, I'm, I just about guarantee you that I'm wrong about something. And I know for a fact that some of you are way wrong, because <laughs> I know what some of you think, and I'm like, no, not even close. So what, what we have to do is that, is that we have to hold our interpretations, and we have to hold the claims that we make for the Bible with with provisionally and with great humility. Um, frequently, you will hear uh, somebody who's a skeptic, and if you're, if you're a skeptic and you're here this morning, A, that's awesome, good for you for being here, thank you for being here. But frequently, you'll, you'll hear skeptics take somebody's interpretation and, or, 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 or the claim that somebody makes for the Bible, and they will make that equal to Scripture itself. Uh, for example, the age of the earth. Um, the Bible never says the earth is 6,000 years old. Or the method of creation. It says that God spoke things into existence. Beyond that, it doesn't give us any details about how God did that or how God made that happen. Uh, a lot of end-time prophecy gets sort of conflated with what Scripture teaches, and people make claims all the time. If you encounter somebody who is doubting the reliability of Scripture, or if you are doubting the reliability of Scripture, be sure that you're making a clear distinction between what the Bible actually affirms and what somebody claims for the Bible or how somebody interprets the Bible. Often there's a big difference between those two. Now, since we live in Huntsville, this next one is pretty important too. 
A lot of folks dismiss the idea of inerrancy because they see scientific inaccuracies in the Bible. Huntsville is a science town, right? We got scientists in the room. So this one's kind of big. One of the mistakes we make is that we try to make the Bible something that it is not. We try to turn it into a scientific textbook. That's not what it is. And I love us, but we Christians are the worst about this. Okay, earlier this morning, uh, we, we heard Psalm, and we saw on the screen, Psalm 19. Okay, verse 6 says, The sun rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Okay, NASA folks, what, what's the problem with that? Scientifically, what's wrong? David's, sounds like David's postulating a geocentric solar system, right? Except he's not. Take, if, I don't, this is one of those places where I don't mind if you take your phone out. Take your phone out and look at your weather app, okay? I, I checked mine this morning. The weather app on my phone told me that sunrise would occur at 6.48 this morning and that sunset will occur at 5.11 p.m., AccuWeather is not denying a heliocentric solar system. The words sunrise and sunset are merely the conventions of language. And David was writing poetry. In the same psalm, a few verses before that, he says, the, the sun is like a bridegroom. I have done a lot of weddings. I've stood next to a lot of very nervous bridegrooms. None of them have ever looked like the sun. He says that the bridegroom is like a champion. I've watched champions. They don't look like the sun. When, when we try to make the Bible a science book, we not only miss its meaning, we set it up to be something that it's not. Biblical authors wrote about events, this is really important, biblical authors wrote about events from a man on the street perspective. They were observational in their descriptions, not scientific or medical or technical. They described the events as they appeared to the naked eye. They spoke, and wrote, they spoke and wrote as poets or historians or preachers or prophets or teachers. In the case of Amos, he was a guy that worked in, in a fig vineyard or whatever they call those things where fig trees are, orchards. They, they were not engineers or scientists or doctors. It's like this. If you ask a scientist to define a kiss... She will tell you that a kiss is the anatomical juxtaposition of two orbicularosaurus muscles in a mutual state of contraction. Which doesn't sound like anything like I, what I would want to do. If you ask a farmer to define a kiss, he will tell you a kiss is something that feels like heaven, tastes like honey, and sounds like a cow pulling her foot out of the mud. I don't think I want to do that either, right? Do you, you remember that time that Jesus told the, told the parable of the mustard seed? It's in Matthew chapter 13. He, he, he was talking about how the kingdom starts really small and grows really big. And in, in, in one part of that parable, he says, the smallest seed in the world is the mustard seed. The mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. You know what? It's not. The smallest seed in the world comes from an orchid that grows in the tropics. So Jesus was wrong. Matthew was wrong, right? No. Jesus was talking to first century Palestinian farmers, not 21st century botanists in the Bahamas. He was trying to communicate truth in an understandable way, a way that connected with that specific audience. He was teaching deep theological truths by using the mundane and the familiar. Had he said, the smallest seed in the world is from an orchid that grows in the Bahamas, his audience would have gone, what's a Bahama? They wouldn't have, that wouldn't have connected with him. He was speaking metaphorically, not scientifically. Here, here's one more thing we need to know when we're talking about the infallible, inerrant nature of the Bible. The Bible does not, and I've, and I've made this claim before for Scripture, okay? I've done this, and I was wrong. The Bible does not answer every question you and I will ever have. And I've said that. I've said the Bible has all the answers. 
Maybe you've heard somebody say that. Well, it, it doesn't. It's one of those claims the Bible never makes for itself. My brother is restoring our grandfather's 1963 Ford Falcon. He's been working on it for several years now. I can tell you with complete confidence that my brother has never once consulted the Bible for how to repair Pawpaw's Falcon. The Bible has nothing to say about that. It's got something to say about some of the language he's probably used while he was working on the Falcon. But he has worn out the 1963 Ford Falcon shop manual because that's the Bible for that project. But there isn't one thing between Genesis and Revelation about how to restore an old car. The Bible doesn't have anything to say about what to do if your computer is infected with the crypto locker Trojan ransomware. Or, or how to make French pastries. Or whether Georgia should have run something other than a cover two defense in the overtime at the national championship game. <laughs> how come y'all don't laugh when I tell Auburn and Alabama jokes? <laughs> I kind of wish it said something about that because I think Kirby Smart reads the Bible. I'm not sure about Nick Saban, but I think Kirby Smart does. <laughs> the point is that when we try to make the Bible something other than it is, a science book, a calculus book, a, a book of secret codes, an answer book. We miss its meaning and we force it to do things it was never intended to do. When we remember that the Bible was written over a period of 1,400 years by 40 or so different authors in three languages, none of which were English, and emerged from cultures completely different from our own. They thought differently, they counted differently, they did everything differently. When we remember all of that, the alleged contradictions and discrepancies vanish. And misunderstanding the purpose of the Bible is not the only reason that readers have difficulty believing the inerrant nature of the Bible. Sometimes we mistrust the authenticity of the text itself. So I want to show you something in your Bible that you may have wondered about. Look in uh, Mark chapter 16. This time I mean it, all right? Really, open your Bible or get your device out and look in Mark chapter 16, verse 8. We'll wait. There's no shame if you have to go to the table of contents. I do it every time I try to find the book of Obadiah. Impossible book to find. And half the time I can't remember if Hebrews comes before or after Timothy. It's after. Okay, so if you're, if you're using one of the newer translations, Mark chapter 16, verse 8, you're in the NIV or the ESV or, or another one of the newer ones you will see something like this between verses 8 and 9. The earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. You see that in your Bible there. What is up with that? We, we don't have any of the original books of the Bible. Isaiah's original book is not sitting in a museum in Jerusalem. The new museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. does not have Mark's autographed gospel under a vacuum-sealed display case. The original books were destroyed or have yet to be discovered, and in an odd kind of way, that may be a good thing. Uh, in the 1500s, I'm reading um, um, an, a biography of Luther right now. Um, in the 1500s, Christians believed that by visiting a church that hosted a relic, they could pay off some of their sins. So in order to attract donors, churches claimed to have some sacred object, a piece of Moses' burning bush or the thumb of Jesus' grandmother. I'm not making that up. So if some archaeologist dug up and confirmed the authenticity of one of Paul's letters, a lot of folks would be more interested in seeing the papyrus Paul wrote on than the Jesus Paul wrote about, which would make Paul turn over in his grave. So we don't have any of the original books of the Bible. What we have are copies of copies of copies. And those are called manuscripts. The originals are called autographs. Makes sense, right? The, and the copies are called manuscripts. Now, the reason I want to talk about this is because you may read about this somewhere when you go to college, a professor will talk about this, and I don't want you to be unsettled by it, because there's really nothing to be unsettled by here. Something happened in and around Jerusalem in the first third of the first century 
that created an explosion of literature, the likes of which the world had never seen. You got to remember that back then, there were no ink pens or leaded pencils, no typewriters or word processors, no printers or copiers or print shops. Writing was tedious, and creating copies of originals was more tedious still. And yet, because of the event of Jesus, people began to write and copy what had been written at a feverish pace. There are more copies of the original biblical documents than any other ancient literature. Let me just kind of give you a rundown here of just some examples. Last week, I talked to you about this guy named Pliny, P-L-I-N-Y, who wrote to emperor, he was the governor of Bithynia, and he wrote to the emperor Trajan, right, and said, what am I going to do about these Christians? I don't know what to do about these Christians. I've tortured some of them, I've killed some of them, but I need you to guide me on what to do. We have seven copies of plenty, of plenty, seven copies of his writings, okay? Plato, the most famous uh, student of Socrates, the Greek philosopher, seven copies of his writings. Demosthenes is one of my favorites. If you uh, major in communication or if you uh, study communication, you're going to read about Demosthenes. Uh, he was an ancient Greek orator, one of the greatest speakers of all time. Uh, but he was born with a stammer, with a stutter. And so in order to get over that, he, he built an underground studio where he practiced his speeches. He's known to have practiced in front of a mirror, and he used to put pebbles in his mouth and try to speak clearly with the pebbles in his mouth so that he could learn to get over his stammer and be understood. We have eight copies of Demosthenes' speeches. Euripides was a Greek playwright. We have 10 copies of his stuff. Tacitus was a Roman historian, 20 of his, uh, 10 of Caesar. Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, 49. Homer, we got a bunch of Homer. Remember the Iliad and the Odyssey? Those were his works. We have 643 documents from Homer. What about the New Testament? The New Testament, just in Greek, we have 5,600 documents copies. We have thousands more in Latin and uh, in other languages like Syriac, Coptic, and, and, and others. We have a staggering number of these biblical manuscripts. And what's more, the ones that we have are much, much older, hundreds of years older than copies of other ancient literature. Here's why that matters. The older the copy that you have, the closer it is to the original. For a lot of these other guys, what we have is 1,000, 1,500 years removed from the original document. The New Testament copies, some less than 100 years removed from the original documents, from the autographs. So the older, the better, and we have more and more of them. So that's what's up with that note at the end of Mark. The oldest copies, and therefore the most reliable manuscripts, ended at Mark chapter 16, verse 8. You'll see footnotes like that in lots of places in the Bible. What that means is that there are some variations between all of these thousands of copies, these manuscripts. And what you need to know is the vast majority of these variations have to do with spelling. An A where there should be an N or a V. Sometimes a name will be spelled one way in one manuscript and spelled a different way in another. John, for example, is spelled with two N's in some manuscripts instead of one N. That happens to me all the time. I get, I get mail addressed to J-O-D-I-E. It's J-O-D-Y, although I'll take either kind. But you see the point. There's just things that don't really change anything. They're just s- s- slight variations in spelling. Sometimes a word is added. Uh, one manuscript will say, our Lord Jesus Christ, another will say, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. There is not a single Christian doctrine that is in any way affected or altered by those minor variations, not one. And do you want to know how close the original documents, the Bible you hold in your hand is? I'll tell you. First, this past week, I called a court reporter friend of mine. I wanted to know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Those people that sit over there by the judge and they type out everything people say, right? I wanted to know how they made sure that their trial transcripts 
were accurate, especially since they have to type so fast to keep up with what everyone in the courtroom is saying. Some of those folks go like 225 words a minute. They're like really fast. She told me that, that they don't use a standard QWERTY keyboard. They use a stenograph machine that types a unique shorthand using phonetics. The newer machines the, then transcribe the court reporter's shorthand back into regular English. They used, to, they used to have to do that by hand, but now the newer machines just do it for them. But to make sure the transcript matches what was actually said in the trial, to make sure that what the court reporter typed out actually matches, the court reporter goes back and listens to a computer-generated voice recording of the entire trial. Sounds like a tedious process. They have to go through the thing twice. So I ask her, what's the accuracy rate of court reporters when all is said and done? When you, when you type out your document and then you listen to the, the, the actual recording and you compare the two, what's the accuracy rate between what you typed out, what the average court reporter types out, and, and the words that were actually spoken? And she said, oh, 98.5%. That's pretty impressive. Biblical textual scholars have spent millions of hours poring over thousands of ancient documents and by analyzing and comparing the oldest copies have concluded that the Bible in your hand is 99.5% accurate to the original documents. The Bible is better than Cal Ripken Jr. It's better than court reporters too. You can trust it. The Bible is the story of how God set out to rescue humanity from the destiny we chose. God called one man, Abraham, to build a family that became a nation and promised that through Israel he would bless every nation. And so Jesus came and did what no other human being was able to do, live God's way perfectly. The cross, the tomb, the resurrection are the climax to that story. And you and I are invited to join that story and watch it unfold in our lives. The Bible is the true and accurate and inerrant record of that story. But you know, if we somehow miraculously found all 66 of the original autograph, hand-signed books of the Bible and verified that beyond a shadow of a doubt, nothing would match what happens when people read the Bible and then live what it teaches. Our problem is not really whether the Bible is true or not. Our problem is that we don't live true to its message consistently. And that's the challenge that I want to give you. It's a challenge I want to make to you this morning as you read Scripture and try to live it out this week. I want to challenge you and I want to challenge me to be people that not only are in the Word, but who let the Word get into us and that we live consistently with what we read in Scripture. That's what's going to make the difference. That's what's going to change our lives. That's what's going to change our world. Will you take that challenge with me? Let's do that together. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing together, and then we'll wrap things up. I am not my I give up.
here this morning. Great morning together. Uh, don't forget to check out your bulletin for things coming up. Uh, we mentioned the Work as Worship live stream conference coming up. The ladies have the IF gathering coming up. They're signing up in the lobby downstairs this morning. Continuing into the Word, Twickenham Kids Registration. If you want your kid to get a slot in our very popular preschool, you need to get online and sign up for that. Youth stuff tonight and all those other good things. And this coming Saturday, we have scheduled a special work day. We are purging garbage. And uh, we have a lot of it, unfortunately. So we're having a construction dumpster coming in. I need some bodies. If you can be down here at 8.30, meet me. We've got the attic and under the stage and on the stage. We're going to just throw some stuff out. And so as quick as we can get that done, we'll wrap it up and get out of there. So hopefully you can come and join me on Saturday morning. Hey, again, thanks for being here. We hope you have a great week. And uh, Tom McKee has our closing prayer. Tom. And the following Saturday, we'll be cleaning out my basement. <laughs> Kidding. If you will, please pray with me. Our Holy Father, we thank you so much for this church. And Father, for your written word. And for the word that is Jesus. Father, as we plan, as we vision, as we try to do your will, Father, I just pray that you give us, first of all, wisdom, discernment, and last of all, courage, Father, to make the changes that you want us to make, Father. You are holy. You are the greatest, and we are the smallest. Father, help us to be salt and light in this world. Help us to go out and be your servants to change this world, Father. There is so much, and it is so heavy on our hearts. But, Father, we know through you it can change, and it will change. Father, thank you for all that you do for us, and thank you for your Son who came to this world so that we may call you Father. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.